recording. Okay. So welcome everybody. Since this is, event is part of the Nature of Writing series in partnership with the North Cascades Institute, I'd like to invite Kim Nelson to say a few words. Kim is the Marketing and Executive Assistance for, Assistant for North Cascades Institute. She's worked for the Institute for one and a half years. And before that, she worked as a naturalist, ornithologist, and park ranger. She also currently lives on the board, uh, lives on the board, Excuse me. She doesn't live on the board. She serves on the board of Skagit Audubon Society as the chair of youth education. So welcome, Kim. Thank you, Claire. Thanks for having me. Um, so as Claire mentioned, I am here today representing North Cascades Institute. If you're not already familiar with our organization, we are a conservation nonprofit, and our mission is to inspire environmental stewardship through transformative learning experiences in nature. Accordingly, we offer programs for people of all ages and backgrounds to explore and engage with nature in the hopes that they'll one day go on to protect these wild and sacred places. North Cascades Institute offers many different programs, including Mountain School, a three-day overnight environmental education experience for fifth grade students. We are also currently enrolling um, our students for our Youth Leadership Adventures Program, which consists of a multi-day backcountry canoe camping uh, field trip for high school students, um, which focuses on climate change solutions and building leadership skills. Additionally, we offer a diverse suite of adult and family programs, which includes field excursions, family camps, art and writing retreats, online classes, and even boat tours. Most of our programs take place at the North Cascades Environmental Learning Center on the beautiful wooded shoreline of Diablo Lake in the heart of North Cascades National Park. We just recently reopened our doors to the public. So if you haven't been before or if it's been a while, now it's the perfect time to plan a visit and sign up and get up there. Um, I also just wanna give a big plug for our many upcoming online classes and field excursions. So we'll be covering topics such as wolves, geology, reptiles, plants, birds, painting, photography, even wildlife tracking. So you can find out all about these programs um, and sign up by visiting our website at ncascades.org. That's the letter N as in North, cascades.org. And as Claire mentioned, uh, tonight's reading is part of our Nature of Writing speaker series um, that happens every spring and fall that we do in collaboration with Village Books. Um, we have three more events coming up in addition to tonight's uh, presenter. Um, so first we have the incredible author, uh, Lyanda Lynn Hopped. So she'll be here to discuss um, her new book, Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. And that's on Thursday, May 6th. And on Thursday, May 20th, we'll have the legendary author and lepidopterist, Robert Michael Pyle, to discuss his newest book of essays um, that's called Nature Matrix. And then on Thursday, May 13th, um, we'll have North Cascades Institute's very own founder, author, and soon to be retiring executive director, Saul Weisberg. Um, so he'll be there along with two of his friends, um, authors William Dietrich and John Miles, and it's going to be a fun celebratory evening in which they'll be discussing their history with the North Cascades, as well as their personal experiences um, with nature writing. So you, again, can find out all about those um, upcoming programs and sign up um, by visiting our website at incascades.org. And I will drop the link in the chat momentarily. So thanks so much for your attention. I'm really excited for tonight's speaker. So I'll hand it back to Claire. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, yes, we're excited for our three remaining spring um, Nature of Writing series events. They're going to be, they're, they're good ones. They've, they've all been, th this has been kind of a, a really stellar uh, spring series, e even, you know, despite, despite the pandemic and it having to be virtual and so forth, we have certainly made the most of it. Um, so, First, I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight's conversation. Roger Gilman is a former literary editor of the Chicago Review and current poetry editor of Adventures Northwest. 
He is a published poet and emeritus dean, dean and professor of philosophy and poetry at Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Western Washington University here in Bellingham. Oh. And uh, yes, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Roger. And now for our featured author, poet. Kim Stafford is the founding director of the Northwest Writing Institute at Lewis and Clark College and the author of a dozen books of poetry and prose, including Having Everything Right, a collection of essays, Early Morning, a biography of William Stafford. We got here together, a children's book, and The Muses Among Us, a book about the practice of writing. In 2018 to 2020, he served as o Oregon's Poet Laureate, and he has taught writing in Mexico, Scotland, Italy, and Bhutan. So tonight they're here to celebrate this book right here, Singer Come From Afar. Please join me in welcoming Kim Stafford and Roger Gilman. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Kim. Thanks to the North Cascades Institute. Thanks to Village Books, uh, one of the great <laughs> locations. I love to hang out there. Uh, it's where I met Roger. Uh, and the conversation we started at Village Books a couple years ago uh, has continued until now. And uh, we talk about philosophy and poetry and the earth. Uh, and our friendship uh, is blossoming in the program tonight. So I'm going to read uh, some poems and periodically Ro uh, Roger will uh, pose a question, a philosophical conundrum of some kind, and we'll uh, share that a little bit and then on through the program. I want to start with a kind of blessing, uh, an acknowledgement. Uh, it's called All My Relations. I want to thank all my relations for this chance to be on earth in her time of flourishing. I want to thank the first people near Village Books, the Lummi people, the Nooksack, the Samish, the Samyambu, and other peoples original to this place to honor their sovereignty in long and continuing relation, still teaching us how we might be here together. I want to thank my father and mother, moon and sun, for sending me forth before their own passing on. I want to thank my grandmother who listened to me so eloquently. I learned to listen to my own heart and mind, to find stories and songs there. I want to thank my family and friends and all citizens and travelers who study and work for deeper kinship in this place with one another and with all creatures, one earth, visible, palpable, fragile, intricate, resonant, in need of our better stories. I want to thank you who have gathered to receive what we have carried here in hopes that something we have may meet something you need so all our relations may be strengthened for the life we live together. Amen. <laughs> Well, gratitude, you know, I've just been reading uh, studies that um, you can have good luck and then be grateful, or you can uh, be grateful and then good luck comes to you. <laughs> you know, happiness comes. So to start with gratitude, and for me, uh, the nature of words, part of it is to, uh, by writing, express uh, gratitude and affection for the people around me, the creatures around me, uh, this time on earth. So uh, one such expression of gratitude is uh, a poem I wrote for the poet Naomi Shihab Nye, who I know has recently been to Village Books. And uh, her poem and mine were on NPR today, <laughs> sort of a strange uh, intersection. But this poem I, I wrote for her out at Fish Trap in Northeast Oregon, where she was visiting as a teacher it's called Our Singer Come From Afar. Be our wren or warbler, lit in willow swaying with your tender weight of songs, sipping the sky to tell us hard things from far away, you freighted here for our understanding and comfort. Sing the mysterious harmony of news and blessing hurt and healing, 
offered with head high, eye bright, until with a friendly shrug you flit away and leave us, strangely younger. Well, that's how I felt after a conversation with Naomi. I felt younger. And, uh, you know, when Kim in her introduction uh, talked about places that are wild and sacred, uh, such places make me feel older and younger at the same time. I remember a conversation with a writer, uh, John Hay, and he was, uh, he was in his 90s and he posed the question, should I want to live to be 100? I want to be a thousand. <laughs> I want to revel in this beautiful earth and serve it. So, so Roger, uh, singer, come from afar. Uh, you've been to Fish Trap. Uh, any thoughts about that uh, that poem? Well, my my first uh, puzzlement was what is the meaning of the hour? O U R. Yeah. Who, Who's in reference there to our singer come from afar? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'll start by saying, Roger, as I was reading that, all uh, my relations, the text before me says what I have brought here, but I realized you're with me, so I changed it to we. And I think the move from uh, my to our, from I to we, uh, is a crucial one. It's uh, sort of endemic to the spirit of all our relations. Well, you know, as you know, but maybe some in the audience don't know, she is a, an American Palestinian poet, a poet born to Palestinian parents in Texas. Yeah. Um, and the hour in that context kind of refers to uh, two sides of a, yeah. well, a debate, an oppression and an occupation and a, yeah. Yeah. and um, I'm wondering if the role of the singer is different if you're one of the victims mm -hmm. or whether you're one of the victimizers. And yeah, yeah, the, you know, her, her father was a journalist. <laughs> And, and he, uh, he got a scholarship to study in America from Palestine, Israel. And uh, he said, uh, send me to the middle because he thought then he would be uh, close to LA and New York, two places that he'd heard about. So he ended up in St. Louis. <laughs> so Naomi started in St. Louis. And I think her father, uh, as a journalist, was always uh, an hour kind of person. He was always interested in uh, a, a border, not as a division between cultures, but as a place where cultures could meet. Uh, so I guess that spirit got into the poem, Roger. Uh, just to follow up on that a minute, um, it seems like the role of the poet who comes from afar, if uh, that person is representing a, a victimized people uh, rather than the victimizers, the yeah, yeah. people with the power, a poet rep like you and me. Yeah, yeah. That our could have that division. But if our is as toward the end of the poem, suggesting that she says, the news I will bring you is that my people will forgive you if yeah. only you repent and repair the damage you've done. Yeah. And so the hour becomes layered in a second or a third yeah. sort of way there in that way. You know, I, I think people better buy this book, Roger, and puzzle over this poem. And they're <laughs> going to have to read it several times. It's, I agree. It's deeper. So I want to... Um, I want to move on to a poem that was in, uh, you know, Roger is the poetry editor of Adventures Northwest, and he was kind enough to uh, publish this poem there. And uh, I want to show you where this poem was written. Uh, a very beautiful place in Northeast Oregon. 
uh, it's a, a scab meadow, which means, you know, the glaciers skinned off the dirt. And so the soil is very shallow and uh, the growing season is very brief in the spring after the rain. And a gentleman named Kendrick Moholt told me about this place. And he said, you got to get up at four in the morning tomorrow because we're going to drive 60 miles to see this meadow. And uh, when we got there, I wept. I wept for the beauty of the place. So I'm going to leave that there while I read this next poem called At the Meadow Called a Scab with Kendrick. It's a scab because the soil is thin. Trees can't grow, so the sun owns it. At the slope's top, a seep keeps sedges. And after snowmelt, before drought, the flowers go insane. Blinding us where crimson runners of wild strawberry knit penstemon to paintbrush, mariposa to yarrow, allium to gentian where bees, flies, and butterflies sip and veer in the swirl of pollen bannering the sun, where deliberate bumblebees tumble into cups of rouge, drunk and heavy, freighted with wild sweet, as I am, weeping so I can't stop, the pang of beauty doomed by human greed, my own nectar of salt brimming at the nexus of sorrow, and resolve. May my life be scab soil, spare but buttoned with beauties of apprehension, small joys strewn across desert days, older, purer, ever more severe in savoring and sustaining what will remain. So that was my uh, encounter with what felt like absolute beauty and uh, tenderness and fragility to me. I love that poem. And the one thing it makes me think about is instead of uh, focusing on a single individual flower or butterfly or animal or even yourself as an individual, um, it's how they're knit together, how these colors are knitted, how they're united, how they're de interdependent on each other. Yeah. And a lot of uh, nature poets write environmental poems about what is surrounding them, yeah. but they, they're not really ecological poets of the interdependence of things, of the network, of the... Yeah. Of, of the relationships it's more the individual scene or the individual animal in the scene or something yeah so you know I, that I, may be that, the tyranny of education roger that uh you know as you move up the uh, ladder into graduate school you're told to specialize <laughs> and so you're the expert like Ke kendrick is the he's the raven man <laughs> but uh he loves flowers too and i think we're back to all my relations you yeah. know the north cascades institute uh when kim went through that list reptiles you know butterflies uh, geology uh, animal tracking and of course a place like village books uh they want to look at the prismatic dimensions of earth experience uh relationships of authors to readers yeah, that's right yeah. Yeah. yeah well here's a here's a poem that does focus on one creature uh, it's called foolish young flowering plum and this was written in uh, february a couple of years ago it's winter dark days still too cold for bird or blossom dull sky and all our hearts in shadow but there, at a ragged cleft darkened by cedars of gloom, a flash of light cries out, the incandescent wisp of wild plum, far too early to be so happy, so naive, a child refusing to obey the rules of grief. 
I just remember that pang to my heart when I saw this plucky little plum tree just <laughs> exploding into uh, this wondrous, uh, you know, just giving its all. And uh, I think that's what happens to me when I go into wild and sacred places. Uh, I'm just stunned by everything around me. Uh, and so a poem is uh, trying to bring some of that uh, back to the human world, some of that testimony, some of that witness. There's a story that uh, in uh, ancient China, uh, you know, the emperors, uh, they had to live in cities. They had to live in palaces. They had to be encumbered with jade and silk and uh and the painters felt sorry for them. You know, they don't get to go out into the mountains and see the wild young rivers. And so they made paintings to bring nature into the palace. And in a way, that's what a, a poem can do to bring a wild place into uh, a civilized life. Um, so Roger, should we forge ahead to this uh, political section? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I made a vow uh, on uh, in November of 2016, I'm going to dedicate my writing practice to healing my country. And so I started writing poems to try to connect uh, divided uh, countrymen. And this one's called The Flavor of Unity. And it started that month of November, I was driving up the Columbia Gorge to give a workshop in the Dalles. And a, a truck passed me um, carrying soft drinks from uh, South America, Inca Cola, I-N-C-A, Inca Cola. And on the side of the truck, it, it said in script, uh, el sabor que nos hace únicos, the flavor that makes us unique. Okay, that's the advertising slogan of Inca Cola. And I thought, I think I need to adjust that. El sabor que nos hace unidos, not unicos, but unidos, uh, the flavor that makes us united. What is the flavor? You know, often a poem starts for me with a question. Well, what is that? What is the flavor that makes us one? So I had to write this uh, little poem to ponder that. The flavor that makes us one cannot be bought or sold does not belong to a country, cannot enrich the rich or be denied to the poor. The flavor that makes us one emanates from the earth. A butterfly can find it, a child in a house of grass, exiles coming home at last to taste wind off the sea, rain falling into the trees, mist rising from home ground. The flavor that makes us one, we must feed to one another with songs, kind words, and human glances across the silent square. It makes me wonder whether that uh, unity that we find for ourselves and the rest of nature and with each other is uh, requires uniformity or can plurality be part of it does it require segregation or integration does yeah. it uh, you know yeah I, i'm remembering roger you're reminding me of a workshop i went to in port orchard uh with a, a greek american writer named olga brumas who was a very uh wonderfully outrageous person <laughs> And I went to graduate school with her, and I remember one day she would say, first I am Greek, then I am a woman, then I am a writer. And then the next week, first I am a writer, then I am Greek, and so on. And one of the things she said, sort of in answer to your question, in my art, I am going to be so uh, flagrantly individually myself that I will encourage you to be yourself so not to be like me uh in terms of my particular habits but to perhaps in a parallel way uh we need to inspire each other to hey this is the land of the free 
basically to be free, to truly be various, be diverse, be wonderfully um, panoramic in our character. I, I don't know. Does that respond yeah. to? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so not unique, uh, not not in the in the marketing sense of better than others, but uh, different, gloriously diverse. I would say different and uh, different, at least on the surface, so that your individual and your personality, yourself, you can be true to yourself, but expressing shared values that are deep. Yeah. So a shareable life that has a particular unique style to it. Yeah. I have an example from recent experience. I went to uh, Home Depot and, uh, you know, I was puttering around with my cart, getting a few things. And this gentleman, I was wearing my felt hat. This gentleman came up to me and he had kind of ragged pants and a you know plaid shirt, working man. And he just launched into an aria and it went something like this. Hey, I like your hat. My hat, I've had it for 35 years. I'm Irish. You know, a fella dropped a tree on me in November. I was at OHSU for six weeks. They thought I was going to die or at least be brain dead. They had to cut open my leg. Here, let me show you. And he pulled up his pant leg. See that line there? They had to cut down to the bone and reconstruct it, you know, and he just went into this thing. And I just felt so fortunate <laughs> that he picked me out. <laughs> for this witness. And to me, Roger, he was an example of someone so much himself and really inspiring me to be gregarious and to connect with strangers. When I was a kid, our parents said, don't forget to talk to strangers. Just the opposite of us. Yeah, when we went out into the world, be sure to talk to strangers because if you don't talk to strangers, if you get lost or you need something, uh, you know, no one will help you. <laughs> yeah, so that, so, so that kind of leads into this next poem. Uh, I actually made a little book called The Flavor of Unity of my um, post-election poems. And I'm going to read a couple more uh, from that book. And one of them is called... Um, New House Rules. You know, I watch a Congress at impasse, uh, you know, the debate society, and I'm going back and forth and not getting much done often. So I decided to write New new House Rules for Congress. So I think they should post this uh, and, and follow it. New House Rules. In order to get beyond impasse, Congress has re replaced debate with a listener's furthering response. You sound upset. I see. That that makes sense. Tell me more about that. I'm sad to hear your pain. Let me see if I'm understanding. How does this make you feel? Have you felt this way before? S could you say again what you just said? I need to understand. How can I help? <laughs> you know, this really came out of uh, in class. Uh, one of my students was a retired uh, psychologist and she taught us the furthering response. Yeah. You know, this is really maybe the key to how to talk to strangers. Uh, tell me, uh, where are you from? Oh, really? What's it like there? Yeah, if I went there, what should I see? You know, this furthering response. Tell me more about that. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, a, a way to talk to your uh, very familiar enemy or yeah. opposition or partisan. Yeah, you know, we had a uh, we had Gary Snyder give a talk in Portland and someone asked him in the Q&A, um, how do you talk to your logger neighbors about environmentalism? And Gary said, uh, we don't talk about that, uh, but we talk about our kids. And uh, I, I often ask, hey, my chainsaw is busted. Where can I get it fixed? Who, who can fix that for me? And then eventually we start talking about forests and trees and rivers, but we don't start there. So that furthering response. So another example of this is uh, another poem called Practicing the Complex Yes. And this started with a friend, uh, in Alaska, Peter Kaufman, who is a, an expert kind of facilitator for groups that are having trouble getting along. 
Uh, you know, he's been sent to Cambodia, Senegal, and so on to work with different groups that are uh, struggling to come to common ground. And he said, well, when you're talking with someone who disagrees with you, there are two words you must exile from the conversation. One is no, and the other is but. <laughs> you have to use the word and. And Roger, I, I feel like we're still on the theme of all my relations because and is the magic word. So, so this is the poem, Practicing the Complex Yes. When you disagree with a friend, a stranger, or a foe, how do you reply but not say simply no? For no can stop the conversation or turn it into argument or worse, the conversation that must go on as a river must a friendship, a troubled nation. So may we practice the repertoire of complex yes. Yes, and in what you say, I see. Yes, and at the same time. Yes, and what if? Yes, I hear you. And how about? Yes, and there's an old story. Yes, and as the old song goes, Yes, and as a child told me once, yes, yes, tell me more. I want to understand. And then I want to tell you how it is with me. You know, trying to earn, uh, earn a hearing by first being the listener, being the interviewer. Uh, okay, one uh, last one from this uh, series of... Uh, semi-political uh, meditations. Uh, this one's called Nest Filled. Mm -hmm. Nest Filled. Use your whirling wings to find the right tree. Use your pert eye to choose a level limb. Use your nimble feet to cherish the hospitable fork. Use your fearless beak to gather twigs, leaves, grass and thistle down to weave your basket house open to the weathering sky. Use your body to be a tint over tender pebbles, lopsided moons, then wait, warm, alert, still, through wind and rain, hawk shadow, owl night. Use your life to make life spending all you have on what comes after. And if you are human, a true citizen, fully awake, then learn from the sparrow how to build a house, a village, a nation. Use instinct to find the right place. Use thought to know the right time. Use wisdom to design the right action. In the era of stormy weather, build your sturdy nest and fill it with the future. I love that. Yeah. The uh, thing we can learn from the birds is how to have a nest full of babies and teach them how to grow up to be young people right. who are individual and happy and know that all of that is interdependent on the lives of not only their parents but the nation the village yeah. the neighbors yeah yeah um i feel like we planned this roger where we <laughs> Uh, around the theme of community and I, I just have to say I love seeing all these faces of people in their homes uh, this village of village books uh, one of the great bookstores I've been in a lot of bookstores and village books is one of my favorites uh, well this next poem is um, I hope it doesn't seem sacrilegious it's called revising Genesis uh, you know, there were two great Bibles in my childhood. One was the good book and the other was uh, the wild. 
and uh, my childhood was spent uh, getting muddy in the creek <laughs> and getting a lot of moss in my shirt from climbing trees and uh, coming home smoky from building a little fire under a hemlock and uh, staring into what I thought of as the architecture of my thought, <laughs> you know, looking into a fire. Uh, and so this poem, Revising Genesis, uh, is, I guess, my own confluence of uh, reading the good book and reading the earth. And God said, rest here in the garden where you belong, where now you know the good from evil, and so the good may be your calling. Be home here in beauty and bounty, and by salt sweat of your close devotion, make earth your wise guide, each creature teaching miracles of being, in wing and song, in blurred heart of hummingbird and deep thump of whale, counting nights in peace and days in blessing as you raise your arms in praise. You know, I, I, I was an, a medievalist in college, and, uh, you know, we didn't used to pray like this. We prayed like this, raising our arms in praise. And there's something physical about that. Uh, I guess it's like a yoga pose, you know, tree pose, reaching to the sky. You know, what strikes me about this is you started from the back, from the end. In Bereshit, in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis 1, it says, In beginning to create the universe, God pronounced everything in it to be good. Oh. And after a whole bunch of verses, it says, And then God rested. Yeah. And your first line is, God said, Rest <laughs> here and act as if you belong here. Yeah. It seems like maybe it covers the same territory, the same ideas, but it's interesting that it starts in a whole different place and ends in a different place, just switched because rest and act as if you belong here means take responsibility and do the good. So it ends up the same place, but it starts Ask backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, poems, uh, they're short, so you've got to, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to get to your conclusion uh, with, with a, a limited delay. That's interesting, though, Roger, that's right, to, uh, I think this poem, I feel we're at the end of a kind of striving as a species. And I would like to think we're at the beginning of a kind of residence, a kind of honorable uh, sense of belonging uh, on earth. There was a saying in, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, most people are at home one place on earth. Uh, the widely traveled are at home many places on earth. But the true soul is home no place on earth, you know, because heaven is the is the destination. I feel something growing in us to honor creation as our uh, our task, you know, our garden. Uh, I've spent the day carrying dirt in my garden and uh, uh, making a hospitable place for seeds. So a, I guess the poem's exploring that. It's a gift, but it has to be taken care of. Yeah, well, this next poem kind of touches on that. Uh, my sense of wonder in the world, everywhere I look, there is uh, another beauty. Uh, it's called Beautiful Redundancy. Every willow leaf aching green from its crimson stem offers another lovely imperfection among these millions along the round stone bank dressing clear streams that are built of rain seeds, all of like mind, flowing so the water knife may cut through mountains and whittle sand pebbles the ants raise into their glittering pyramid, 
studded with blue flowers so microscopic they bring me stunned to my knees to whisper holy, holy, holy. Why this profligate redundancy of beauties everywhere I turn? The old leaf gone to lace, the new sprout small as a comma, each seed hurls toward the sky. Bird song, rain glisten, snail whirl, butterfly unfurling her spiral tongue. It must be a kind of merciless democracy of beauties voting for our attention, every child open-mouthed in wonder. To not see this is to die a little. To not hear, not touch, is to be tyrannized. To not defend this is to be complicit with sorrow, with fear in betrayal of earth. I say, send your pleasure hungry forth, to be stunned by every leaf from the crimson wand of willow aching into green. So there I am in the garden, Roger. Well, it reminds me of Ronald Reagan's comment, you've seen one tree, you've seen them all. Oh, I have such pity for uh, the blind That's in that That's sense of not being able to see. Uh, you know, that kind of blindness, it's only one step to you've seen one person, you've seen them all. That's right. You know, you've seen one immigrant, you've seen them all. Uh, and that kind of categorization uh, as a prelude to judgment is a danger not only to the earth, but to the happiness of the perceiver, yeah. I believe. Uh, yeah, the redundancy of leaves or anything else, the sameness with small differences is valuable in that particularity and individuality and uniqueness is one of the values, one of the things that makes things beautiful. Yeah. 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 Well, this Not next one sort of builds on that. Uh, it's called Every Weed is Precious. In this extinction era, dandelions, sassy at the cracked curb, illuminate our chance as the old gold horde of monarch butterflies once bannering the sky dwindles to a few, I can't slap the dusty miller. Where wren song is gone, mosquito hums holy, 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 and a thread of moss in any concrete seam spells intricate salvation. I bow to the pluck of life wherever green leaves wag or small wings beat. You know that what jumped out at me when you read this is the word can't, C-A-N apostrophe T. Yeah. I, I can't slap that thing and kill it. I can't be reckless with this. What, what does the can't, what kind of can't is that? Is that a psychologically I can't do this, or politically I can't do this, or morally I can't do this? Well, um, what do you, or is it all This is a kind of an oblique response, but um, my father was a pacifist in World War II, and he, uh, he didn't know what to do about Hitler, but he wasn't going to kill any young German men. Uh, he just said, I, I won't kill. And so they put him in an internment camp and he became an artist. <laughs> it's quite a story. But, uh, you know, I, uh, someone asked Gandhi, a soldier asked Gandhi, Mahatma, when shall I put down my gun? And Gandhi said, when you have to, when you have to, when something in you says, I can't do this anymore. And uh, one thing my father said is uh, everyone is a conscientious objector at some point. There are many things you will do, but at some point I won't do that. And that kind of uh, moving moment in what you can do and what you will not do, what you can't do, 
I think is one of the things we're here to figure out. Uh, and it may change over the course of your life. The capacity to do that and the willingness to do that is what makes us human. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Roger, I'm going to show a little film, and then I think we're at the point for uh, Q&A. So, folks, if you have a question for you, you have a chance with a philosophy professor here, uh, that question you've been carrying, or for me, uh, if you type it in the chat, uh, Claire will take a look at it. But I want to uh, show you a poem in which a poem, a, a little film, in which a poem is accompanied by music on the harp by a harpist named Bethany Lee, and then by images of the wild world. So I'm hoping, let's see. Okay, take me just a moment to get this going. Yeah. Lessons from a tree. Seed split, root sprout, bud leaf. Delve deep, hold fast, reach far. Sway, bow, lean, loom. Climb high, stand tall, last long. Seed, thicken, billow, shade, grain. Ring, grow, sow seed. Whine, sing, flicker, glimmer, rise by pluck, child of luck, lightning struck, survivor. Hollow, glisten, witness, seed again. Remember, testify, thicken, burn, bleed, heal. Seed, learn. Nest, host, guard, honor, savor. Seed again. Fade, groan, sag, crack, split. Soften, slough, grip, gather. Then arc, swish, sail, fall, settle. Log, stump, slump, sag, surrender, offer, enrich, be duff, enough. So that little film is on my website, along with writing prompts and songs and uh, drafts, translations, all kinds of things, kimstaffordpoet.com. And that poem is in the book. So uh, Claire, are you there? Do we have some questions? Here I am. Um, well, that was so gorgeous. Thank you, the, that video, those images and the sound, the music, all of it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, well, let's see. Most recently, Kim um, from North Cascades Institute was wondering, what was the name of the poem about the birds that you read earlier? Well, the, the one about B.R. Wren or Warbler, that's Singer Come From Afar, that title poem of the book. Okay. Uh, okay. Was that the one, Roger? Or was there another? <laughs> I'm yeah. getting confused. Yeah, there's one other. Uh, let me see. Oh, nest filled. Maybe it was nest yeah. filled. Oh yes, nest filled. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah that starts yeah. when you 
think like a bird. Yeah. Yourself as a bird. Yeah. So we have an interesting question from Anne. Um, there's a little bit that leads up to it. Um, she says, I want to thank you for the poem Curse of the Charmed Life, which was on Writer's Almanac. It touched my heart and resonated for me with Victor Frankl's posthumous book, Yes to Life in Spite of Everything, and his pointing out 11 months after leaving a concentration camp that suffering and one's response to it is forms forms one, one of the pillars of life's meaning. And she says, am I right that you would resonate to that thought? Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I posed a question for myself. This is like being a philosopher. What is suffering for? And I think in my life, uh, the function of suffering is to help me become more compassionate. Mm -hmm. You know, without suffering, uh, I would sail past uh, my fellow creatures, both human and otherwise, who are in precarious uh, states. Uh, but with suffering, like, uh, here's an extreme example. And um, after my brother died by suicide, I could read the grief in the faces around me. Uh, you know, before that, uh, everything was sweetness and light. Uh, but suddenly I could see what people were carrying. And the curse of the charmed life is that you're uh, cut off from relationship with people who are suffering hardship. Roger, do you have, do you have thoughts about that? Well, I, I agree with that. Another possibility is that to experience suffering yourself or in someone you love, leads you to a proper melancholy about existence, not something that's full of despair, not something that's Pollyannish and uh, ridiculously silly about happiness, but something that adequately acknowledges that life can only exist with the death of other life in some form or other. Life only lives on organic molecules, not on inorganic ones. Yeah. And that means death of a carrot, yeah. or it means death of something. Yeah. But so our attempts to make the earth beautiful and healthy and our relationships with each other that way I think properly has some level of contentment and pleasantness, but it, it can't be ridiculously against the facts yeah. of life that, that there's a cost to that beauty. There's a cost to that love. Yeah. I'll just read the last lines for Anne of, the, of this poem, Curse of the Charmed Life, which was on Writer's Almanac. Without hunger, it's easy to be heartless. Without hurt, you are disabled. Without the battering of bad luck, the pummeling of lost hopes, the wounds of life without love, of dark dreams that last passed on, how can you know what one life might do for another? Back to relationship. Thank you for that question, Anne. Claire, what else do we have? Well, Kathy, um... This one is, of, um, well, on a, kind of in a different vein. Um, Kathy says, my sister and I are studying poetry using the Norton Anthology of Poetry. We're buying books from various authors. Are there any college texts, texts you would recommend to further our study? She says she loves your poetry and she's thanking Village Books for this reading. You're very welcome. Thank Kathy. you. Well, I want to put in, you know, our current poet laureate, jo Joy Harjo, uh, has just published with others a couple of anthologies of uh, native uh, writers all across, a kind of a geography of native voices in poetry. And I think that would be a very rich place to go if you, if you look online for Joy Harjo anthology. I think you'll find those. Uh, a lot of voices that we haven't heard otherwise. Yeah, Roger. 
and Kevin Young has just published the Amer uh, the anthology of let's see what is it called of African American poetry, but it's what is it the singer and the struggle or something like that by Kevin Young. It's in the American Library series. That also will give you voices you not yeah. probably. What am I thinking? Don't go online. Call Village Books and tell them what you need. That's the way to go. I also recommend this one by oh, the, yeah. called The Muses Among Us. Eloquent right. listening and other pleasures of the writer's craft. Yeah, there's some ideas in there for writing. Thank you for that question. Anything um, else? Yes, there is another one. Um, Maria says, uh, Kim, you are so incredibly prolific. I wonder about your practice. Do you write daily? Do you divide your day between the business of writing and publishing and the creative process? Thank you for this reading. Um, also, you chose my chapbook, Mother Want for Writing Contest 2020 Water Sedge Chapbook Contest, and I thank you so much for that. That was such a, that was an easy choice. Yeah, that was a great, great collection. Thank you. What a pleasure to meet you at Village Books. Um, well, my uh, practice is uh, carry around this little notebook, and I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being barraged with, uh, with different things. Um, and so just the last uh, couple days, you know, I wrote down uh, the ladder and the wall. And this was based on a news story I read that all along the wall, along the Mexican border in Texas, there are ladders. And, you know, the wall costs about $27 million a mile to make, and the ladder costs about $5. And this photographer had just photographed these ladders. So I just wrote ladder and wall. And I thought, yeah, I'll write a poem about that. So I did that. And then uh, uh, I was driving along the freeway. And I saw in the razor wire around some installation, there was the, the plastic film, you know, from a dry cleaner's uh, bag that was caught in the razor wire. And it was just so absolutely beautiful the way it was fluttering and so i just wrote a razor wire and plastic film and today my poem uh, was about how out of this brutal thing of steel and this petroleum-based uh, you know terrible piece of plastic this graceful dance was happening and then i'll, I'll just do one more here um I have written abundance cherry wood potholes. Okay, so I was driving through my neighborhood. This is one street that just has so many potholes. And one neighbor has this giant pile, wood pile. <laughs> I don't even know if they have a fireplace. It just keeps getting bigger. And then a little farther, this is cherry tree that is just full of blossoms. And then they're all the potholes. And I thought, I'm going to write a poem about abundance. And it's going to be a celebratory poem, uh, but it's going to include things that are easy to celebrate and things that are hard to celebrate. <laughs> it's going to celebrate the potholes because they make us drive slowly through the neighborhood with children. Anyway, so my process is, you know, notice things, jot down a few words, and then the next day, if you go to my website, you can find the four-step daily writing ritual uh describes what i do so it's there on the kimstaffordpoet.com thanks for the question um i would also like to put out point out that um christian martin from the north cascades institute also put some great links in the chat for folks to check out um, um videos of you reading some of your some of your poetry kim so um we encourage folks to check those out and um i am being the bookseller in the room i'm going to put the village books link back in that chat to remind everyone that if you click on that link it will take you straight to the village books website where um kim's books are all listed and that, that you can one-stop shopping just click all those right there um and I, that's actually all that we have for for questions we have kind of a quiet quiet group this evening yeah but, we, um, we made them meditative roger well how about yeah. if we do, how about if we do one final poem and, yes please uh say farewell this is a, a poem uh of the salish sea 
uh, I had an invitation to write a poem about orcas, orcas, uh, and it, it, this poem came flooding forth. You know, sometimes I have my sort of careful little, I have some notes and so on, but I started thinking about this and uh, when I was in uh, grade school, I got obsessed with the Quagutal people with their iconography and their, um, just their way of being in the world. Uh, and then when I was in graduate school, I remember I was about to have an all-nighter uh, writing an essay that was due the next day and I was w walking down the library uh, shelves at the University of Oregon and there was a moss green book that caught my eye and I pulled it down and it was uh, Franz Boas, the anthropologist, Geographic Names of the Southern Coagutal. And I spent the night reading this book. I, I can't remember what I did about that assignment, but that book became the inspiration for my book, Having Everything Right, because it turns out there is a place on Vancouver Island on the Nimkish River called Elada, which in, uh, in, in Guagutal, which means the place is called having everything right. And it's a place where there is such abundance that everyone gets along and there's peace and there's prosperity and uh, relation. So that uh, iconography came flooding back in this poem. Uh, it's called Earth Totem. Dorsal cedar dressed in moss where the village stood. Crest carved, fresh and proud, the clan not yet defeated. White on black, the color of starlight, high and old. Glittering where the sea's back breaks open. In the strait, their formation ancestors could use to teach children the ways of courage, certainty, persistence. Thriving where king salmon thrive, the throng charging in their own endemic wave through waves, splitting the eternal, binding what flows, braiding salt to salt in a shape the old ones carved in stone. Up from the hidden, forth through the hungry, diving secret swallowed by the sea. Who will lead us into the future if not these? Who will teach us high respect if not the whales that prey on whales? Who among us can dance like that in storm or cold driving through shoals of silver where all the little lives glitter in beautiful fear? Hold honor of ancestors in our keeping, destiny of children, eel and clam, eagle and heron, bear and frog, all the woven hungers nourishing us by their vigor, their abundant life. How can we meet our children's eager, brimming gaze if we let the orca essence falter, barren, hungry, gaunt, if our pod of treasure dive? never to return. Well, thank you, Roger. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Kim and the North Cascades Institute. And thank you all for coming. Yes. Uh, vote for the future by buying books from Village Books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kim and, and Roger. This has been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to the audience for tuning in tonight. And um, we appreciate you. And I think, I think with that, we will say good night. So, Farewell all. See you down all right. the road. All right. Bye-bye.